And that, my friends, is how epigenetics works. Say your great-great-grandmother was pregnant during the famine. Her body is going to do everything it can in order to ensure that her future generations are not malnourished in any way. So her body may enhance certain genes that promote fat retention. It may suppress certain genes that lead to a faster metabolism. Because in a famine sort of environment, you want to retain as much fat as you can. And so that's why people with two different genetic backgrounds, even if they have the same exact diet and exercise routine, can have two completely different body types. Hot fresh knowledge for your brain, who wants to learn the difference between a grasshopper and a locust? It's a trick question, but it's also not a trick question. They are different. This is a grasshopper, this is a locust, but they're members of the same species. Grasshoppers turn into locusts under very specific circumstances. When resources are dwindling and grasshopper populations get forced into smaller and smaller areas, their little grasshopper bodies rub up against each other, and it triggers a special chemical in their brains that makes them go through this transformation. Their bodies get darker in color, and the peaceful, solitary grasshopper turns into the scary, swarming locust. And boy do they swarm, and boy are they scary. There are reports of locust swarms devouring the clothes off people's backs, the wool off of sheep. They're very different, but they are the same animal. And that chemical, by the way, serotonin. The hormone that makes people experience happiness. What the hell, nature? Name something that the paranormal community is not ready to hear. If vampires existed today, they would almost certainly have a reflection. The reason vampires didn't have reflections in the old tales is because mirrors used to be made with silver. And most supernatural creatures have a weakness to silver. When the vampire's reflection bounced off the silver mirror, it wouldn't reflect. It would stop. The silver would essentially kill the reflection. But silver mirrors kind of went out of popularity in the 1940s. So nowadays, the mirrors you buy and the mirrors you use aren't silver anymore. And if there was a vampire staying behind you and you looked in the mirror, you would definitely see him and you wouldn't realize he was a vampire. Hollywood tends to get this one wrong a lot, too. By the way, this is not an admission that vampires are real. The council would be very upset at me if I admitted that. That ghostly blue glow that you're seeing there is called Cherenkov radiation. And it's basically a sonic boom, but for traveling faster than light, rather than traveling faster than sound. Now, how does that make any sense? Nothing can move faster than the speed of light, right? Nothing can move faster than the speed of light in a vacuum. But when light's traveling through a medium, like the water in that tank, it slows down quite a bit. And in a big nuclear reactor like that, you can absolutely have particles that travel through that medium faster than the light can. And when that happens, it produces that eerie blue light that we call Sherenkov radiation. And it is freaky as hell to think about, man. This is a Sicilian. Take a close look at its face. See those teeth? It's pretty much a giant worm with a huge set of fangs. In one species of Sicilian, a mother will give birth to a bunch of babies. Those babies will immediately start eating their mother's flesh for nutrients. So a Sicilian is kind of like a giant fanged worm that gives birth to cannibalistic worm babies. What if I told you guys that part of the ancient Egyptian empire was in the Americas? Then I'd say you're full of shit. Back number one, our national parks. Let's take a look at places like the Grand Canyon. Sweet baby Jesus. Here he's trying to convince you that the Isis temple feature at the Grand Canyon was an Egyptian pyramid or something, but I'm pretty sure this is just because he googled places with Egyptian sounding names in the United States and then went from there. Anyone in their right mind knows that this isn't a pyramid, but if you need me to prove it to you, then here it is. It has all the exact same sandstone layers at the same levels that the surrounding canyon does. You can literally see the Coconino sandstone cap on this, as well as the bands of the same sandstone at the same level around the side to the canyon. Y y you baffle me. What's your next point? For those of you who've been with me for a while, I made a video a while back known as the Melted Buildings Theory. For those of you who've been with me for a while, you'll know that I debunked that shitty theory. But what if this is an Egyptian arch that was destroyed? You can see runoff patterns coming down. Of course you can see runoff patterns coming down, because it was eroded by fucking water, you du- You can literally see the same sandstone layers in this arch that you can on the parent rock in the picture that you're using as an example. Oh my god! Ezekiel 22, 21, Yea, I will gather you and blow upon you in the fire of my wrath, and ye shall be melted in the mist thereof. 
meat. Traces of cocaine and nicotine found in some Egyptian mummies have led some to speculate that ancient Egypt may have traveled to the New World. Ah, the remains of Henatawi. This is an interesting one. I'll cover this in more detail in another video, but here's what you need to know for now. While initial toxicological analysis of this mummy suggested that there may be the presence of some nose candy, subsequent analyses uh, proved completely inconclusive. However, the subsequent analyses did prove that there was nicotine, which some theorize may be because the mummy was contaminated because when it was discovered, everyone was smoking. This may just be contamination from archaeologists with cigarettes and not an indication that the mummy liked to spark a dart every once in a while. When are people going to realize Haru is patterned after the Palomando falcon, which is a bird that's only indigenous to the Americas? They're not going to realize that no matter how many times you quote yourself. Egyptologists believe that Horus is based on the Lanner falcon because it's a falcon that's indigenous to North Africa. Stop just saying things and expecting them to be right. And just keeps looking at sandstone erosion features and claiming they're pyramids or statues or something. I refuse to subject you guys to any more of that bullshit. I would like to dedicate this video to my patrons, Josen, Nomi, and Tyler. My various social medias are linked in my bio, and as always, remember to stay curious, stay inquisitive, and most importantly, take a geology class. You are about to see me feed what I would arguably say is the cutest spider on the planet. Here she comes. This here is my black velvet spider named Blueberry. The thing about Blueberry though is she can be pretty shy when I feed her. As you can see, she's about to get spooked and well, she'll run back to her burrow. No, don't go Blueberry. It's okay, it's okay. Ah, ah come back. Okay, okay, that's fine. Let's try again and see if this will make any difference. Oh, here she comes. What is she doing? She's upside down. Blueberry, what are you doing? What the heck is this? You're on your back. <laughs> Blueberry. <laughs> oh my gosh, this spider is hilarious. Well, I mean, whatever works. Attack from your back. Oh, she got it. Awesome. Like and follow for more animal videos. In the wild, horses don't have people to trim their hooves. So the reason that horses have to have their hooves trimmed is because they're living modern, sedentary lifestyles. A horse's hooves are growing all the time. It's just like fingernails or hair. The hooves are supposed to be like naturally ground down as they walk around. But that doesn't really happen for domestic horses because they're not walking all that much. You know, they're just like spending life in their stables. And when they do go out and walk, they're walking on like really soft surfaces that were created by people like grass or like soft sand. This is actually the same reason why modern people have to go to the dentist all the time and get their teeth fixed. Because we don't eat all the rough foods that ancient people used to eat. And so our teeth can grow in all crooked. Nobody ever said that there wasn't downsides to the modern sedentary lifestyle for both people and horses. Running my guitar through McDonald's Sprite. Thank For this one, I'm going to try and synthesize a bouncy ball. To get things started, I'll add about 300 mils of water to a beaker, and I'll turn on the stirring. Now, I can dump in some sodium hydroxide drain cleaner, and I have to wait for it all to dissolve. When I didn't see any left, I turned on the hot plate, and I waited for it to heat up. It now seems pretty good, and I can start adding some sulfur. I'll do it slowly to not mess up the stirring, and in total, I'll add about 30 grams. At first, it doesn't seem like much is happening, but the sulfur is supposed to be reacting with the sodium hydroxide. The sulfur should be turning into a mixture of molecules called polysulfides, which are soluble in water. This process is really slow though, and it took about 30 minutes for most of it to react. I'm eventually left with this dark orange mixture, and when I turn off the stirring, all of the unreacted sulfur sinks to the bottom. To get rid of this sulfur, I'll get another beaker, and I'll pour out just the dark liquid. I'll also add a stir bar, and what I have to do next is wait for it to cool down. 
This ended up taking about 40 minutes, and now it's finally time to make the bouncy ball. To do this, I just need to add something called 1,2-dichloroethane. It again didn't look like much was happening, but then the color quickly changed, and I started seeing some solid stuff. This was all something called thiocol rubber, and now I basically just had to wait. For a while, it kind of just looked like a mess, but then it started clumping up into a chunk that was rolling around the beaker. Over the next 20 minutes, it slowly got bigger and bigger, and when I felt that it was done, I turned off the stirring. What I had to do next was pull it out, and I was really hoping to see a nice ball. However, it was a lot more rectangular than I expected. I then washed it in some water to try and get rid of some of the chemicals. So now, after all that work, I have a little rubbery cube. It isn't as round as I was hoping for, but it's still really squishy, and I think it should be able to bounce. Okay, so I don't think I can call it a bouncy ball, and it's more like a kind of bouncy cube. 